I want us to realize in the very first verse that David makes his mistake. And it came to pass after the year was expired, at the time when kings go forth to battle, in other words, the fall has come and winter's, winter has ended, David sent Joab and his servants with him and all Israel, and they destroyed the children of Ammon and besieged Rabbah. But David tarried still in Jerusalem. You know what we've said many times about what seems to be just a passing comment? But they all have significance. Some of them very serious significance, and this did with David. He wasn't where he ought to be as a king at the head of his armies, which you can see from the passage, it was customary for that to happen. In those days, the wars that went on and how they had to fight them, then they had to fight them in good weather. Winter time, they all went into encampment and ceased it. But David doesn't go out. And the verse ends by saying, but David tarried still at Jerusalem. That was unusual. Now notice the very next verse. And it came to pass in an evening tide that David arose from off his bed and walked upon the roof of the king's house. And from the roof he saw a woman washing herself, and the woman was very beautiful to look upon. Now there's a lot of things being said about David. When he saw the woman, he should have looked the other way and walked away. Godly people had done that. Remember Joseph and Potiphar's wife set her eyes upon him to get him to commit adultery with her. So we're seeing something about David's character here. There's a lot we can say about uh, being on top of the houses that time, why they were built. They were their decks of that time and so forth, and that's why he's there. But it's in the late afternoon, and she's taking a bath. You say, well, she was probably very indiscreet. That's so, but he was the one that had the lust in his heart when he saw her. So he inquires in verse 3. You know, he is the absolute monarch. It is interesting that they are that close together in where they live, with, as far as one another is concerned. And that may say much about Uriah as to his closeness to David, and we will know more about that just a little later. So they report to him, this is Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite. Now we will say this maybe as we're passing again later. Uriah is not an Israelite. Uriah is a Hittite. How can he be in this close proximity to the king? Because later we'll notice that he's numbered among David's mighty men. So he's been around David for a long time, and I would say we can safely predict or else report that he was from the evidence an officer in David's army. In fact, he lives where David can look over and see his place. Well, David sent messengers, verse 4, and took her, and she came in unto him, and he lay with her, for she was purified from her uncleanness, and she returned unto her house. Well, it was a one-night stand. His lust was gratified. And now remember, he already has 20 other wives, if you count them. You would think that among those 20, his appetite would have been assuaged. The problem is that when people cultivate that kind of thing, it never is assuaged. As the old saying goes, the grass is greener on the other side of the fence. And when you consider the times, and how they viewed things, how they viewed women, and all that kind of thing, which is virtually foreign to our mind. It's, it's just hard for us to get our minds wrapped around that. And it's so foreign to the New Testament's teaching regarding husband wife relationship and what a marriage is. Nevertheless, this, this is the facts of, these are the facts of the matter. And, of course, she conceived, she sent and told David, and said, I'm with child. Now, that sets everything into motion. And I'd like for us then to uh, consider further about how David tries to get this because it causes him to do a lot of things that I don't think probably he ever thought he would do. But he does. And when you look at um, verse 2 and when you see the results of it and you notice what happens then you'll see that uh, we're introduced to this man. 
this Hittite, not an Israelite. And let's look at that for a moment. First of all, with Bathsheba, who is called Bathsheba, the daughter of Amiel in 1 Chronicles 3, 5, we see that this was a legitimate variation of Eliam. The component syllables being placed in reverse order. Now, what we're noticing here is why in translations and in examining the manuscripts and seeing these different names sometimes, it poses a problem because uh, they call one another by different names as just as uh, we do sometimes. I remember the last thing Dad ever said to me. I walked in the hospital room, and he was basically out of it. He said, hey, bud. Well, that's not my name. I remember talking to my grandfather, my mother's father, over the phone. One of the last things he ever said to me when, when he answered was, hey, bud. But that's not my name. So you see how names work. So you've got this happening then. The word means the God of my people or the people of my God. Bathsheba's father, Amiel, is also said to be the son. Now, this is interesting. Maybe somewhat speculative, but it's based in the facts of the scriptures. The son of Ahithophel. Now, we come across Ahithophel, 2 Samuel 23, 34. And that would mean that Bathsheba, now listen, Bathsheba was the granddaughter of Ahithophel. And this may explain, I say may explain, Ahithophel's opposition to David during the rebellion of Absalom. It certainly didn't help it very well. He would have resented the shame and disgrace that David brought upon his beautiful granddaughter, Bathsheba. Now, we don't know that much about how she tried to resist or anything else, but in those days, he had an armed escort to bring her to the king. That's all we know. And he would also know that things happening in those palaces in the court didn't remain there. All these guards are going to be talking, and it's going to spread. So all that's in the mind in view of what the law taught about people committing adultery. Now, I'll say all of that to get us to Uriah. Uriah's name is a compound word, and it indicates that he is a worshiper of God. Now that possibly tells us that he would be what we would call in the New Testament a proselyte, a convert, if you would. And both Amiel and Uriah were numbered among David's, as I said earlier, we'd get to this, mighty men, 2 Samuel 23, 34, and 39. Now he was with David, therefore, back when the times were rough, and they were considered by a lot of people renegades. David's respect, though, for his loyal soldier. Now, get that in mind. That's why I want to talk about Uriah the Hittite, this servant of Jehovah. The king led him to use his wife or caused him to lose his wife, the king's own lust. He let another man's wife allure him because obviously she was very beautiful. The scripture says so. So we see he sends messengers, 2 Samuel eleven forty, And the whole point was is to have sex with her, 2 Samuel eleven four. 4. Now think about that for a minute. This is one of David's loyal, and you're going to see how loyal in a minute, who never knows how he's being used by his friend to whom he is so loyal. Let that sink in. You know, Jesus tried to vaccinate us against persecution. When in Matthew 5, somewhere around about verse 44, he talked about people despitefully using you. Now, if there was an example in the Old Testament, where David despitefully, or anybody else, used somebody, it's David's despiteful use of Uriah. Uriah never knows about what's going on as far as the record is concerned. So the man who had previously shown himself so noble and chivalrous, David, now stoops so low, 
to rob one of his own officers of his honor. God took note of that. He focused in on it very closely. And right here we'll just say in passing that his punishment on David, though he repented of his sins and was forgiven, is very strict, stern, harsh punishment. This set the stage for the brutal, savage rape of his daughter Tamar by one of David's sons. Here were the cause of Absalom's murder of Ammon. Then Absalom himself, as conceited as he was and proud, rebelled as a consequence of all this because of his lustful violation of Bathsheba, that is, David. God revealed to David that because of this terrible sin, though he was forgiven, listen, what a condemnation. The sword shall never depart from thy house. And if you will read from here on, what there is said about David in his life is miserable. Written aforetime for our learning to teach us better how to live under the New Testament of Christ. And certainly does this. God says what he means and he means what he says. So from that day forward, all kinds of horrible crimes and feuds and scandals and miseries were involved in David's life. So she tells him she's with child, 2 like Samuel 11, 5. And we're back to where I said we would go a while ago. Starting in verse 6 and reading down a ways, we've got all this about Uriah. Now notice how David begins. He says, send me Uriah the Hittite, 2 Samuel 11, 6. David had only one purpose in this, namely, that of bringing Uriah home so that the child to be born to Bathsheba might appear to be the child of Uriah. This effort is David's number one, if we begin to enumerate them, to hide his own sin. Now, remember the early days of David. Remember the things David wrote. Remember the things David did in the days of his faithful service to God. Remember he's a man after God's own heart, etc., etc. And it is true, as I've preached often, when he is confronted with his sin, he's teachable, he's humble, and he repents. The Bible's clear on that. But at this point, he's about as low as you can get. And this is a friend. This is a loyal servant. One of David's mighty men. One who would stand by him. One who is exemplary in loyalty and faith to David. And David is undercutting him every move he makes in an attempt to cover up his sin. So we ask him, verse 7, how the war was prospering. Well, that wasn't a concern to him. It was hypocrisy on David's part. He had brought Uriah to Jerusalem for a completely, utterly different purpose than that of getting information about the progress of the war. It's to deceive Uriah. Biblical friends do not strive to deceive such men as Uriah and the relationship he had with David. Now that's David's effort number two to cover his sins. Then in verse 8, go down to your house and wash your feet. Now that is his number three effort. Wash your feet simply says your own leave. Your wife's here. Go home and relax because you know what's going to happen. But look at the character. Focus on the character of Uriah. This in effect was a, was a direct invitation of the king. Just simply spend the night with his wife. It's all concerned about David. Talk about me, me, me. That's all it is. It's all about David. So we see that they understood things that way, 2 Samuel 11, 11. But look at the loyalty and the sacrifice which shows us something about a great godly character and what we can emulate. 
Uriah slept at the door of the king's house, 2 Samuel 11, 9. Now there's guards all around and servants and so forth, uh, obviously. And David instructed some of the servants to observe Uriah's actions. We wouldn't have this record of the details. You notice how detailed it is about what Uriah's up to. David knows exactly what Uriah's doing. It would do well for us to remember what an absolute monarch is. I don't care whether he's placed on the throne by God or not. He is the absolute monarch. His word is law. And in those courts, and all you have to do is read some history about the intrigues of those courts, even up until relatively modern times, to know that everybody knew what was going on, and there was always somebody vying for something to get favor with the king, and then there were those who would seek to even overthrow him, such as Absalom would do later on. So they told David, Uriah did not go down to his house, verse 10. Well, David would have been naive indeed if he supposed that the members of his household had faithfully kept his sinful behavior secret. I think it would be naive on our part in reading this to think that this thing the king had done would be so secret. I mean, this is what Hollywood looks for to make hits. You can't. You can't get any, the only thing you'd have to do to this record is have a professional script writer script it, and it's ready to be filmed. And if it's advertised right, and you get the right people acting the right parts, then of course it appeals to the mentality and lust of this present world. Now there was a film made in the mid-50s about David and of course it camps a lot on this regardless of all the other stuff that there was to tell about David that's just the way we are and being the way we are in general as humans is why there is a place called hell then notice the ark in Israel and Judah dwell in booths in tents or whatever you know they took the ark with them this is in verse 11 it was a sign that God is with us. That was customary of all those pagan peoples. Uh, not just Israel in its service to the true God. So that meant God's with us. So he's thinking that way. My companion soldiers are out there living in tents. They can't be home with their wives. How can I do this? Most people, and when you talk about or read about or see movies about World War II, people want to go home. They're hoping they can go home. They're looking for leave, whatever. This man had it. But because others of his companion soldiers could not enjoy what he was able to enjoy, he deprived himself of what even the king told him to do. Now, I remind you, he knew nothing about being used, but he was being used all the time. So he said, I won't do this thing, verse 11. And the flat refusal of Uriah to spend the night with Bathsheba forced David to take further steps because he's still engaged in the vain effort of trying to conceal his sin. After all David had done, wouldn't you think it would dawn on him God knows about it and knew about your plans to do it before it ever happened. But that shows you how a great and godly person can slip, slide away. And that's all I can think of that happened as he sought to gratify with a beautiful woman, somebody else's wife, a loyal soldier that he had known for years, one of his mighty men, and yet he showed no concern for your eye. By the way, we'll say it now. But Uriah dies not knowing anything about this. So he remains in Jerusalem, verse 12. And that's David's effort number four to cover it up. Well, he's, he's working harder because now in verse 13, David gets him drunk. And that tells us something about why we don't want to be drunk. That is, we're not sober. We don't think straight. Thus, anything around that would make our minds not work as God made them to work as well as they can is simply a sin. That's why so much is said about be sober. Not that you're un, not, not under the end or it's only referring to alcohol or something. It just means think soberly and face the facts every day of your life. And don't try to live in a fantasy world. 
So this effort number five is that he tried to make him drunk. Now David sinned here another time too because Habakkuk 2, 15 and 16 says, Woe to him who makes his neighbors to drink and makes them drunk. Shame will come upon your glory. Now you know what this says? You lie once, you lie again, you keep turning it up, you keep engaging in other sins, all to cover up your own sins against God. One fellow wrote, Robbing a man of his reason is worse than robbing him of his money. And drawing him into sin is worse than drawing him into any trouble whatsoever. That's a pretty good comment. So we've already seen that one sin leads to another. And when once a sinner has embarked upon that downward road, there's no limit to the number of grievous sins that he'll commit. And then we come to verse 14 where we have the plan. I just get rid of it. No compunction of conscience. No consideration for his wife. No consideration for his loyalty. No consideration for his sacrificial devotion to David. No consideration for all the years he stood with him through thick and thin. I've just got to take care of me. So he sends a letter. And who delivers the letter? But Uriah himself. And it's his own death warrant to Joab. What a shame. But it ought to warn us as to what we can do. And that's his effort number six. Some of the servants of David died in the process of David getting rid of Uriah the Hittite. Because he said, now Joab, you take him and you put him in the very thick of the battle and they withdraw from him. And if you read the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Old Testament, the LXX, if you read the account it gives of this, it says 18, it numbers them. It says 18 men died so that Uriah could die. What did David care? Yet that thing was contrived just to get rid of Uriah. They didn't make any wise military anything. And look at Joab. Are you a Joab? Am I a Joab? He knew. He was David's lapdog. If David said jump, he asked how high. And when he got up there, he asked when to come down. Whatever David, you read about Joab's work with David. Whatever David said to do, Joab would do it. So here's the massacre of these men to be able to kill one man. But then you can see further that Joab added to the terrible, wicked drama because he went through the form of sending the king a report of the disaster which followed sending them near the wall. You know, we don't think this way much as we watch some Hollywood movies about sieges. They knew better to get very close to those walls because that's when they could be fired upon and they had to be pretty close when you think about throwing rocks down on them and shooting arrows and so forth. So normally no general, no commander is going to allow his men to do that. But he went through the form of sending the king a report of the disaster which followed his sending men too close to the wall. And this was a hypocrisy again on his part. He makes the messenger believe that David will be displeased at the loss of life. And this is where he adds his seasoning to the thing. And when he's displeased, he'll blame him for the lack of caution as the commander. So it's a curious thing that the messenger was instructed by Joab to make mention of the death of Uriah only after the king expressed his anger about losing those men by Joab led him get too close to the wall. It's all connived. It's all covered up. What does that tell you about any government, about any fight, about any war, about any disaster? Now, some of you don't know anything about this, but the first time reports of great slaughter in a war, as far as the United States is concerned, was in 1864 at the Battle of Cold Harbor when the Confederacy was completely put on the defensive and Grant had taken over and he sent men at Cold Harbor, and they were slaughtered by the droves. 
and they would not let the northern newspapers print how many died. That's the first time that we know of in American history that happened. So it's always been done, and you see the conniving here. Now, evidently, Joab and David both knew we can overcome this city, but they did this all because of one thing. David is seeking to protect himself. And look at all the people that have been drawn into this, but especially poor Uriah the Hittite, whose name means a servant of God, who wasn't even the Israelite, who was one of David's mighty men, who was loyal to him, who had a relationship with him. And maybe even, this is a maybe, since he was close enough to the palace that David could look that over on the housetop or wherever she was, we could say David was a peeping Tom, <laughs> however he did it. The point is, he used man. He used an honest man. He used a dedicated man. He used, as far as the scriptures are concerned, a godly man. He used a man who converted from a pagan religion over to Judaism. He wouldn't even take advantage of what the king commanded him to do, to go home and be with his wife. He reasoned like my fellow soldiers are still out there in tents. Why should I do this when they can't? What? That says so much about this man's character, devotion, faith, loyalty. But now here, we must bring this down to us. Because as I said a while ago, Jesus told the apostles they will despitefully use you. I think of Demas, companion to the great apostle Paul in the preaching and defense of the faith. And yet Paul would have to write, Demas hath forsaken me, having loved this present world. What evil will men do to protect themselves? Anything and everything. What's the proof of that? Well, several places in the Bible. But David is a prime example. So really, you drag other people into things. But now as we bring the lesson to a close. All who live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Paul mentioned that there are perils of false brethren. David was one of those false brethren to his loyal and dedicated mighty man, Uriah the Hittite. And Uriah died, according to the record, to please David, to suit David, to help David hide his sin and never knew about it. Brethren, when you go out to live the Christian life, when you are associating with people and listen, even in the church, you have to vaccinate yourself against being despitefully used. You know, these words aren't in the Bible just to take up space. They have a message for you and how to live the Christian life and to serve God and to be faithful through whatever it is that Satan throws at us. And it can come from those that you least expect it. Do you think you're right by any stretch of the imagination thought David would do him this way? There's nothing in the text that says he had any idea about it that he would actually commit adultery with his own wife. We're not talking about any sin on her part. We're just talking about David. He's the monarch. He's the initiator of the whole mess. And then what he did, how far he went to save, or he thought, his own skin. Rather than I tell you as surely as I look at you now, if that happened then, and is written four times for our learning, and we're warned in the New Testament against those who would despitefully use us, then what does that say? Is it going to happen? Are we going to be ignorant of Satan's devices, that being one of them? Surely, we need to be mindful of those things. And surely we can see that can arise from your best friends and from your own house. If we don't see that, how do we see anything the Bible teaches about being righteous and walking the straight and narrow way of truth? It's given to forewarn us. It's given to help us. It's not, it, there's nothing in the Bible that's not designed to get you to heaven. And thus, this lesson also. So remember, good Uriah the Hittite, who was used and abused by those closest to him.
to their own end as they saw it. The other thing is at close is that, of course, if you read chapter 12, you know that he didn't get by with it. And I'm thankful for the great prophet Nathan because he did not mince words when he stood before David. And after telling that story, which we won't recount now, Bible students are familiar with it. He looked David in the eye after David had out of his own mouth condemned himself. He said, Thou art the man. And what I'm so thankful for, though the sword did not depart from David's house the rest of his life, is that all David said, have you ever noticed this? I have sinned. Then go read Isaiah 51. There was no effort to justify himself. I mean, Psalm 51. There's no effort at all. None whatsoever. I have sinned. I have transgressed God's wall. I have violated God's will. I said it all. I did it because I wanted to. I did it because I lusted after her. Of course, he spared the penalty because Uriah's dead. And at least takes Bathsheba into his house. Now, there's all sorts of things we might study about Bathsheba, but that's neither here nor there. When you think of character, when you think of loyalty, when you think of being despitefully used, then let there be forefront in your mind Uriah the Hittite. If you're not a child of God this morning, we beg, we plead by the mercies of Jesus Christ to seriously consider becoming a Christian. That's your only hope as the Bible defines Christians. To believe in Christ on the basis of the Word of God that gives you the proper evidence to do so, Romans 10, 17. And you must or you can't do anything beyond that in the way of meeting the conditions of salvation. Repent of your sins, Acts 17, 30. Confess your faith in the Christ as the Son of God, Romans 10, 10. Complete your obedience to the gospel and be baptized into Christ. By His authority, in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, for the remission or forgiveness of your sins. If you'll do that, the Lord will add you to all those who have done likewise, and you can labor faithfully in the Lord's cause in His church until Christ calls you home. But now have you committed sin? As a child of God, you need to repent of those sins, confessing them, and pray God for forgiveness. And so I leave you with where we started. Remember, Uriah, the Hittite, as we stand and see.